make our beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God, whose word I praise. And the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to you? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thanks offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet are fallen. That I may walk before God. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all our righteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed.
dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support, to support us in all dangers and to carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated for our readings. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 through 24. God will raise up the prophet. The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desire of the Lord your God at a horror on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up to them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Our epistle reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. For us, there is one God. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge is something of love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something that he does not yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is loved by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God to one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as it really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the for if anyone sees you who have knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, he will not be encouraged. If his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols. And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, and the brother from whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Please stand. Together we say the Alleluia verse. <clears throat> Alleluia. They were astonished at the teaching. For they taught them to someone who had authority. Alleluia. Our gospel today, once again, comes from Mark, the first chapter. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, and crying, crying out with a loud voice came out of him, and they were amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, Who is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. 
and at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You can be seated for our hymn of the day. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, that gospel lesson, was it just another typical day in the synagogue or at church? You notice, once again, we're back in Mark chapter 1. We're starting at verse, we've only completed 20 chapters, or verses rather, in the, this beginning chapter of Mark. And already we've had John the Baptist's ministry, Jesus' baptism in the Jordan by John, Jesus tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the imprisonment of John the Baptist, the calling of the first disciples, and then we have this lesson already. See, Mark's gospel is this quick, 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 fast-paced gospel. Instead of having sandals on his feet, Jesus seems to be have, having track shoes on his feet more because of just that style. Kind of reminds me of a kid coming home and telling that story. And then, and then, and they just kind of keep and blend that whole day in about two minutes. Telling everything they did, and it's all tied into one sentence. See, that's the style of the book of Mark, and much of it. And that's what we have here, this quick action paced Jesus. And a phrase that we see over and over again is this phrase, and immediately... We have that again here. It says, and immediately they went to the synagogue in Capernaum. Because he's jumping from that one story to another. It has that really quick, choppy style to it. Um, and because of that, really, historians lately have thought, this must have been the first gospel written because it's not nice and smooth and drawn out with lots of other detail. Uh, I don't think that's true. The teaching that I received that kind of goes back to really what the early Christian church that claims Matthew being that first gospel. Uh, the reason why they say, like I said, Mark is because of that little choppiness, and they think over the course of time, the other synoptics, Matthew and Luke, took it and kind of expounded. But this is just the style of Mark, this quick style. So the question I would have for us today, looking at this choppy lesson that we have, in just eight verses. Is this just another typical day at church? Well, it might be a typical day for Jesus, but because that's what he was doing. It starts out, he was entering the synagogue and it's saying, it's that idea, this is his custom. He's going into the synagogue. That's what he did. Every Saturday or on the Sabbath, that's where he would be found. He would be going to the synagogue. Here he was, God himself. Here he was, he knew everything. He knew the teachings better than the, the rabbi who would be up front speaking. But he was there to worship. He was there as a lesson for us as we look at this. So what other things do we see happening in Jesus' life? Once again, he's teaching the people. In this whole book of Mark, we see a lot of his teaching, interacting with the people who are around him. And in Mark... Many, many people call him rabbi or call him teacher, uh, not just the Pharisees like we see sometimes in the other ones. But his teaching, his teaching had power. His teaching had authority. It says, not like the scribes, not like the people they were used to hearing. See, the word of God, here he is in the flesh. He, the very word of God, now it's easy to say, this is who Jesus is. He's not going to stand up and say, no, you know, I kind of think it might be this way with God. No, he had authority when he spoke. He was willing to point out the sin of the Pharisees. He was willing to offer that mercy to the people who needed that. See, it's an important thing that we see here. And then, right away, he jumps again in, in this section. We have a kind of scene within a scene. We have him teaching and with this great authority, but then there's this unclean spirit. This man comes in there with an unclean spirit, and Jesus immediately casts this spirit out of him. 
Because the Spirit's saying, I know who you are, we know who you are, Jesus. And he quickly silences them and casts them out. And even his actions, his words to an unclean spirit have that kind of authority. Silencing the enemy. It's interesting because what was the demon doing at that point? The demon is saying, you are the Holy One of Israel. The demon himself, Satan himself, is calling out Jesus for who he really is. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But see, Jesus doesn't want his testimony to come from the devil or the people who are already enslaved by the devil. Jesus wants his testimony to come from his believers, from you and from I. And Satan knows exactly who Jesus is. Satan knew that that's the one who's come to torment us, the one who's going to imprison us, and that's what he's saying. But Jesus silences him. Because he's not silencing us as his believers. He's telling us, now that's your job, to proclaim, you are the Holy One of Israel. It's our job then to proclaim that. So was this a typical day? at that synagogue? Well, for Jesus, like, like I said, this is his typical day. But for those people who were there, they were amazed. They're amazed because they're seeing this new style of teaching. They're amazed because it's not every day you go to a synagogue and see an exorcism starting, you know, happening right then and there, the casting out of the spirit, of the unclean spirit. So it got me to thinking and said, what if this was Good Shepherd that Jesus walked into on a Sunday day and he took over and these things were happening? Would this be a typical day, a typical day of what we would see? And I suppose we could say, no, if, if Jesus came in, it would be anything but the typical because this is not what we would be expecting. I think the first thing that that would show us is when we walk into the church on a Sunday morning, that we're not expecting to see Jesus here. See? Because too many of us say, well, if this idea of these things that were happening in that synagogue happened, that would not be what we would expect here at Good Shepherd. And I think just the opposite. These should be what we expect here at Good Shepherd on any given Sunday. Do you expect to see Jesus here? Do you expect to come in and encounter with his word the same way that was happening in that synagogue? See, Jesus spoke through the word. So many of us come into a church because, well, I'm doing my time. I've got to keep mom and dad happy, or we've got to keep the wife happy, or whatever it is. I don't have anything better to do. It looks good for me in the community. And the list can go on and on in our own sinfulness why we choose to do what we do rather than looking at him to see what he's doing now it's true we typically don't see exorcisms the same way happening here on a given Sunday but we'll get to that in just a moment and of course back then it says he taught with authority unlike the typical preacher so I guess that's the slam at me so if the pastor isn't speaking God's word, if the pastor isn't experiencing or exercising God's authority, and unfortunately pastors, including myself, will fall short on that same one. See, so if we're saying that this is not the typical scene of a good shepherd Sunday morning, we're living in sin. See, that no, saying this is not us, I think is going directly against what the scripture is saying. It's showing that we really don't respect God's word enough to expect something with great authority, to expect great things to happen through his spoken word. In the old prayer of the church, it used to say, talking about the prayer for the word, that we are to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest God's word. We'll be in God's Word, studying it, reading it, marking it, and putting those little notes in the Bible, learning it for our daily lives, and inwardly digesting it. It becomes our food. God's Word is our food. I think we have a lot of starving Christians in this congregation. 
people who are not in God's word. It says right there, we're the inwardly digest. But if we're not in God's word, we're starving ourselves. We're starving us from the very thing he wants to give us. He says, I want to give myself to you. And it comes through my word. In the third commandment, in the meaning, he's talking about remember Sabbath day and keeping it holy. Luther puts it like this for us to remember. He says, this means that we are glad to hear God's word so that we do not despise the preaching or the teaching of his word, but hold it as sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Later in the book of Mark, he uses this another phrase over and over again. It's, he who has ears, let him hear. And see, we hear God's word speaking to us. And like I said, for many of us, that time in God's word is too short. And it doesn't matter if you're on this side of the pulpit or on that side of the pulpit. All of us can count ourselves into that. Many of the people don't expect great things out of Jesus. All authority has been given to me and I'll give it to you, he said to the church. We have God's authority. That same authority that he is preaching that day is the authority that we, good shepherd, have to preach God's word. That same authority that he is using there is the same authority we have to impact our lives. To impact the lives of those in our community. Those in our family. People who need to hear that authority of the one who has broken the darkness of sin. But see, too often... We try to reason people into the kingdom or we come up with other ways rather than looking at this as the authoritative word of God. We're not willing to stand up for what it really says. See, so often we don't see those evidences of God's authority in our lives. And once again, we're living in a sinful situation. If Jesus is teaching that they is any different different from the preachers that means for me as a pastor when I don't preach God's word with conviction that means with the fullness of the law in other words week after week if you're not feeling like you're getting hammered with God's law and feeling oh my goodness this is coming right at me then that means that's my sin that I'm not preaching God's word in a way that you're realizing that you're a sinner because I'm looking out at a bunch of sinners you're looking right back at one here too, aren't you? Because that's who we are. That's who we are. We are sinners. And for me as a pastor, if you've ever felt like after you've been hammered by that sin and the law and haven't felt the relief, haven't felt the relief of knowing that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on the cross freed you from that sin, if you've never felt that after that, and that's my sin also. That's the times when I come short with sharing you that good news that your sin is forgiven. It is a typical day. It should be a typical day in our church. See, that authority is there. That being in God's word should be there. But how about that exorcism? You know what? We've already had it. Did you notice it? It started off in the beginning of our service. We confess the sinfulness. We confess that old Adam once again has been in our life. That sin that we have is around us once again. We got to be freed from that spirit again. We confess that sin. Now, true, I didn't hear a whole lot of shrieks happening as a result that when I pronounced that your sins are forgiven. I suppose in some way we should. We should have a, ah, finally that spirit is lifting us. That idea that, that sin, the devil, is taken away from us. See, the power we have, the forgiveness is so strong. See, yes, if Jesus was to enter Good Shepherd, we can expect that. Guess what? He has entered Good Shepherd. He's here right now. That's the message that we bring. The same way that he's entering that synagogue is the same Jesus who comes here. We've already heard from him. We've heard from him in the confession and absolution that your sin is forgiven. We've heard from him 
as we recited that psalm in the beginning, and here is God's word there. We heard, as Jay read the readings from the Old Testament and the New Testament, we heard his gospel reading. We've heard from Christ. We hear from him now in the preaching from my lips to you that your sin is forgiven. The sin that I'm exposing in your life was taken to the cross. See, the same Jesus who graced that synagogue that day is the same Jesus that we find here today. I'm teaching with authority. See, Jesus came, and that same teaching is alive and active. It says that the Word of God is alive and active and able to cut to the very marrow of us. And it can separate our sin. It penetrates us into us deeply to show us that sin. But that serve that sword of God is also one that is able to take away that sin and then once again show us that salvation that we have. So that exorcism, as we have already experienced it in those ways, and once again we will see that we celebrate that same victory. That victory that happened afterwards, that the casting out of that demon and then celebrate the Christ with them is the same thing that we will have as we come to the Lord's Supper. That our sin is forgiven. That all power and authority has been given to us. All power and authority of Christ is given to you in your baptism and it forgives the sins that we have. So yes, this is a typical day. And typical day doesn't mean it's oh hum. Typical day should be, wow, this is what I get to experience day after day after day in the life of being a Christian. I get to come in contact with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who in His Word wants to reach you and empower you for living. And each day He wants to come to you and say, that sin, the sin that you're holding on to, give it to me. Because I'll take that sin. I'll take it to the cross. And the exorcism, that forgiveness that we have that comes from that is ours. Pretty awesome, isn't it? To know that forgiveness is sins that life and salvation. And the way Mark speaks here, it's just like a whole home day, but there's so much in there. And the same thing in our lives as we look at this scripture. I hope that we see that this is an incredible day. It was a typical day in every day in our life with Jesus Christ is an incredible day. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us to realize our neglect of your word. Our neglect of seeing you in our worship. Our neglect of seeing you in our daily lives. Help us to see you through your word. That you would come to us. That you come to us and say, give me this sin and take it to the cross. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, enable us to live that faith, to live that life where we joyously serve one another and are close to you. We thank you for that exorcism, the removing of that spirit that can show us before that we are now your people. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and confess your faith in the word of the Nicene Creed. <coughs> I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. And in my Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary.
now the benediction with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.